There we go. This is Tony Salern. Hey, so good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And congratulations, right? I think congratulations are in order as well. You're a, you're a new Microsoft employee, aren't you? Relatively. Yes, I am. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> That's exciting. So exciting. And uh, today you're going to talk to us about uh, cross-platform unit testing. Yes, I will. Fantastic. The, uh, the conference is yours. Take it away, sir. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Also nice to see you guys again after a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Tony. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm currently a software engineer at Microsoft, working on the Azure Mixed Reality Cloud Services. So uh, my talk today is titled Exploring Cross-Platform Unit Testing Tools for .NET Core. And I think this is personally important because um, since the gradual shift from .NET framework, which has notably been proprietary and Windows only, there's kind of been a need to really understand how um, how unit testing looks like for this new world of um, .NET Core, cross-platform, and open source and stuff. So today I'm going to be working through a bunch of different unit testing tools, and um, we're going to you know, I'm going to highlight a bunch of things that have been a bunch of tools slash products that have been proprietary and um, closed source and only um, an exclusive to .NET framework. And I'm going to provide alternatives that are cross platform and some of which will be open source. So um, to get started, we're going to talk about testing frameworks. I think this is something that is I mean, I think everyone knows about uh, testing frameworks typically, you know, they're there are a bunch of different tools in one, but I think the primary use case of them is basically to like, run unit tests and write unit tests. So they provide a bunch of different facilities from test runners to um, some of them actually do include the session frameworks out of the box. So um, these are the pretty much the most popular testing tools in the .NET ecosystem. As you can see, we're actually doing pretty good here because um, Pretty much all these tools are cross-platform, they're free, as well as open source. So we start with XUnit, NUnit, MS Test, and Fixy. So Fixy might not be so popular to a lot of people, but I'm going to show you a bunch of a quick sample about what Fixy looks like. But it's actually a convention-based unit testing framework that is great for people who are, for developers who really like a lot of minimalism. Because it does, it includes just the bed, the bare minimum out of the box. So this is an, a quick example of how a unit test, um, an X unit unit test code file looks like. Um, typically, it's super simple. You have a, you know, you have a test method. You have, um, you have an assertion library library out of the box, and you know, nothing too crazy. And then this is Fixy. So as you can see here, Fixy doesn't really have any um, fancy um, imports that you have to bring in, you do not have to apply any crazy different attributes. It generally uses a convention based um, testing approach where it looks for classes that end with um, tests and um, basically just runs the tests or the, executes the methods within them. And it actually depends on, it doesn't come out of the box with an assertion library. So um, here we use Shudley. I will talk about Shudley later on in this um, presentation. So next up are session libraries. So session libraries allow you to assert the various things, or basically assert that your various conditions in your tests have been met. For a lot of people, there is no need to actually have a separate assertion library because most unit test frameworks kind of come with those out of the box, like we saw with, um, like we saw here with XUnit that has an assert equal. However, we do have um, a whole class of tools that are purely focused on allowing us to easily accept that various conditions are met. And most of these tools differ in the fact that they kind of introduce different user experiences. So here, here are two assertion exclusive uh, testing libraries. So we've got Fluent Assertions and um, Should We. They're all, they're both cross-platform, they are both free to use, and they are also open source, which I think, in my opinion, is a is a big win. So this is how it should be looks like. Um, as you can see, it's it it works by 
providing extension methods on basically objects. So when you call uh, a calculator.add method, for example, you do not need to you know, pass that to another method that says that, that kind of does the assertion for you. You can basically just call the dot should be extension method on, on the return and it will be able to check that real quick. Same here with um, the second page, which is um, person dot first name dot should be one of. So I think shouldly is actually pretty neat because it um, kind of gives us a very natural way to um, to look at asserting the various conditions in our test are met. It kind of feels a bit more natural than you know doing the whole assert that equals. But hey, choose your poison. And then mocking frameworks. I think pretty much every programming language, uh, every programming platform out there has a concept of mocking, which kind of lets us, um, basically lets us mock different parts of um, of our application in a situation where we do not want like the actual thing being done. So for example, examples of things you would mock would be database calls, network calls, because traditionally unit tests shouldn't necessarily be making, um, be changing like, global states or changing like database entries and whatnot. So yeah, we've have we have a bunch of units of um mocking frameworks that have been around for quite a while. I think the second one here, mock, has been is I think the oldest and kind of the most popular. We're also lucky that all of them are cross platform. They're all free and they're open source. So mock is actually pretty good. It's, I, as far as I'm concerned, used by a lot of people, including companies and indie developers. Fake it easy is another one that is also quite intuitive to use. And then there's also n substitute. I haven't played around with n substitute a lot, but um, yeah, I mean you can take a look at all three of them and figure out which one kind of fits your best use case. But so far, I found mock to be the most um, the most diverse in uh, functionality. So here's a simple example. So here we have an interface called ifu that just um, defines a single method called get called on get count. So in a situation where we would like to um, test and uh, test the, the ifu um, interface, or we would like to test the method that takes the ifu interface as um, as a, an argument, we can choose to mock the ifu interface as opposed to using a concrete class. In a situation where IFU is kind of like a database client, let's say IDB client, you want to mock that because you wouldn't want to pass in um, a concrete DB client class because you do not want your, name, your unit tests um, making changes to the database. So this is uh, pretty simple. You see the setup for the IFU is actually quite straightforward. And then you can tell it that it should always return number 23. And then calling that object and it lets us access the actual concrete object that was generated behind the scenes. So mock, uh, here mock actually does a whole bunch of like um, code generation, runtime code generation to actually achieve this. And then yeah, so anytime you call a full of get count, it always returns 23 because that's what we um, defined as the mock behavior. Uh, the next one is um, isolation frameworks. Isolation frameworks can be thought of as mocking frameworks plus plus, I guess, because um, typically mocking frameworks are limited by the fact that they can only mock things that can be extended by the regular C sharp language. So, for example, mocking frameworks are able to mock um, interfaces, they're able to mock um, virtual methods. However, when it comes to things like static methods, um, concrete classes, sealed classes, and whatnot, um, working, working frameworks fall short, and that can, that's kind of where isolation frameworks um, take things from. So an isolation framework allows us to mock pretty much anything in um, in your code. You could mock static classes, you could mock non-virtual methods, you could mock um, sealed classes as well. Heck, you could even mock things that you didn't write in assemblies that you didn't like. You have no access to the source code for, and Mark, isolation frameworks are kind of controversial. However, there has been a bunch that have been around for quite some time. I think the very first on the scene was Microsoft Fix, and that was I mean, created by Microsoft ourselves. 
Um, and then you have uh, proprietary um, tools like JustMock and TypeMock Isolator. So all of those are pretty much .NET framework only. And um, I think by definition, they only work on Windows. And then you've got Smocks and Pools. So Smocks and Pools are open source. They're free to use. However, Smocks is, um, Smocks is Windows only. Um, Pools is actually cross-platform. Pools is a product of my creation. However, I, I no longer actively maintain it. So um, it might not be, you know, I wouldn't advise anyone to go use it. So we're kind of limited to um, Windows for now if you want to do anything re relating to uh, mocking of study classes. And um, yeah. And then um, here's a very simple example using Pose just to give you an idea of how um, isolation frameworks work. So here um, you can see we create a shim that says we would like to create a shim for the for all calls to date time dot now. And um, what happens here is we're simply saying whenever there's a call to date time dot now, you should always return um, the re the result of new date time two thousand four four four. And so what happens is um, in that isolate block that you can see on uh, the next line. Whenever there's a call in any of the methods in that block, or you know, it's a recursive thing. So in the methods they call, the methods that those ones call, all um, calls to date time dot now return a very a single the same date every time. And you can imagine this this being useful in situations where you're trying to test out subscription, um, trying to test out that subscription code to say, oh, you know, let's make sure that when um, the time, the date is this, the subscription is appropriately canceled, the, the user is appropriately rebuilt and stuff like that. But um, yeah, like I said, controversial, you should a lot of times try your best to use interfaces for things you'd like to extend. And then the next one is fake data generators. So these are actually particularly important. I'd say they're one of the, I'd say they're actually one of the most uh, important parts of um, unit testing. Because a lot of times you want um, you want an adequately randomized um, data set generated that allows you to test multiple different um, cases, as opposed to you manually providing the data yourself. Because chances are you might not provide the data that um, might not cover all the edge cases. So fake data generators kind of help with that. Here we have a bunch. Of, we have four of them, and all of these are, I mean. Except Faker.net, most of this year are um, cross-platform, they're free and they're open source. So here's an example of uh, using Genful. So here you can see we create, we're able to, we have the person class and then we're able to create um, a single person. Uh, we're able to create a list of people. And what happens behind the scenes is that uh, Genful basically just um, generates different, uh, generates data or if you're using the first and last name, properties of um, the person class. So you don't, you know, you don't have to. So if you wanted to test a situation where you'd like to send in, I don't know, a list of a thousand people, and you don't now you no longer need to like write code to create um, all of them or figure out a good way to randomly generate all of them. Genful um, fake data generators will kind of you know do that all of that for you. And then the final one, I think, is code coverage. I think this has been a huge bone of contention for a while because um, for most of the code coverage tools that were on the block were kind of still .NET framework exclusive and Windows by extension. So um, here we see a bunch of, a few ones. We see, um, I think the, the first three are um, to our Windows only. Open Cover actually works with .NET Core. However, um, and it's also open source, which is a good thing. However, it only works with .NET Core on Windows. Same with um, VS Code coverage and uh, .Cover. So .Cover is you know, it's proprietary. It's by, made by CheckBrains. And um, VS Code coverage, I mean, you have, to, you have to get a Visual Studio license for that. And then the last three are open source, fully cross platform, and absolutely free um, coverage um, alternatives. So here we see Coverlet, All Cover, and um, 
and mini cover. So you can take a look at those for your um, for your .NET Core for coverage needs on like Mac, Linux, and whatnot. So um, I think I'm gonna do a quick demo to show how all these things kind of come together. So let's see. Okay. So here um, I have a very simple. I have a very simple person class. It just does three things. It has the first name, the last name, and it has a full name that is expected to return um, all of this. And then in my test, so in my test, I'm currently using XUnit as the, you can see over here, XUnit as my testing framework. I am using um, Genful as my, I'm using Genful as my data generator, and I'm using Shuli as my um, assertion library. So this is a very simple, you know, contrived example of how to kind of use both of them. So here we have first thing, we do a generate new person. Um, and then the next step is we figure out that, okay, when we call the full name on the person object, we're able to get the actual full name in the format that we expect it, which is basically, uh, which is first space, space last. And then this is how we test um, full names. So yeah, this kind of shows us the best way to Kind of shows us like the combination of Shuli, Genfu, and unit and X unit. So in a situation where we would love to like figure out our code coverage for this um, for our, this test, what we can do is if you look over here, you can see I have this thing called the coverlet.collector. And what happens here is um, we're including the coverlet code coverage tool in our project, and this allows us to. So I'm gonna show it instead. So let's see. So running our test normally, I think it should all pass with as quickly as possible. Waiting, 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 waiting. Okay, that my test seems to be taking a while, which is kind of weird. Or I can just come here and just run it to show you. Ah, there we go. It took a pretty little time. So let's just hold on for it. Ah, there we go. Now with the inclusion of the coverlet collector, we're able to do this to get our, so to get a code coverage for yourself, you can just do the .NET test dash dash collect and then do the, use the collector ID, which is called expat code coverage. And then doing this, we'll actually, we'll run the test as usual, and then have coverlet collect the coverage afterwards. So this is wrapping up real quick. So as you can see here, it has a, it says, um, it says it's got attachments. So if you go over here, and come down here. If you can see the code coverage output in Cobertura format. Cobertura format is actually a very pretty standard format and supported by most um, continuous integration um, systems, including um, Azure DevOps. So I know a lot of people would love to like see, be able to get um, like a summary, like see at a glance what their code coverage is right here in the console. So um, we can switch that up a bit. So I just want to mention before I switch over that um, when the new .NET Core 3.0 CLI, when you do a .NET, when you create a new MS test, um, unit test project, coverlet or collector is already kind of um, comes out of the box with it. Um, but if you're using any an alternative testing framework, then you want to kind of include it directly from Nugget. So I'm going to remove this real quick, just to demonstrate something. And then I'm going to add a .NET a package, coverlet.msbuild. So this is going to install the coverlet msbuild integration package. And once that is, fully restored, I will 
demonstrate how to use it as well. So we're just waiting for it now. Let me close this while I'm waiting. I don't need Visual Studio. Installing, installing, there we go. And then now that it's installed, you can do a .NET test. So because it's MSB integrated, you'd have to use the MSB P and then tell it to collect coverage. And then what would happen is you'll basically do the same thing as before. It will run your tests, but then instead of just spitting out um, the results to a file, it would actually show you. So yeah, it'll show you the summary right right here in your console. So here we have you know 100, which is kind of pretty awesome. And it also still spits out a result file in its own JSON format, but you you have the option of you know changing different form using different formats from open cover to copy to as well. And um, yeah, I think that will be it for my for my demo. I don't have much to demo and also run out of time. But yeah, does anyone have any questions? Wow, you covered a lot. <laughs> Questions? Anyone? That yeah, that was a lot, Tony. Oh my gosh, so many different frameworks. <laughs> and we were we were talking about Gen Fu. Yeah, Gen Fu is really cool. Um, I've uh, have you looked at some other? I, I don't. I didn't hear if you mentioned like Bogus and there's some, there's some other. Um... Oh, you know what? I think Bogus. Let me go back. I I am well aware of Bogus. Yeah, yeah, Bogus is right here. Ah, okay. I am well aware of Bogus. Yeah, yeah. I remember I had a chat with the maintainer sometime last year. Is uh, it's actually pretty cool. I'm just a bit more familiar with Genfo, which is why I built it. Oh, by the way, I should mention that everyone can, you know, go actually check out these tools for themselves and pick out kind of what they actually want. I just had to pick one of out of a hat to demo. <laughs> <and demonstrate. laughs> it's a good list. How did you personally get interested? This is something you've you've really like. Uh, a field you understand very deeply. How did you get, you know, to be an expert in this? Well, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't consider myself to be an expert, <laughs> but um, I guess um, it was when I needed to, I, I was actually making the switch from .NET Framework to .NET Core. I was an early adopter of .NET Core. Mm. Um, been using it since um, when it was in beta one. And um, I needed to do a bunch of like code coverage, a bunch of testing related things and i remember i kind of hit a bunch of roadblocks so some of the the cross-platform open source free um testing tools i presented here today i actually created a few of them i know about just coverlet, at definitely. the man yeah coverlet's pretty famous is, is that maybe one of your most famous ones it was coverlet oh yeah it's the most famous one <laughs> actually <laughs> Um, in the yeah. chat room, um, Ozbob is asking, what, what what's the modern alternative for fakes? Uh, it used to be Pose. However, Pose doesn't have a... It's not particularly easy to maintain across mm -hmm. um, changes in the runtime because it uses a lot of undocumented runtime features. So, um, yeah, I can't really say. I mean, I'd say you could, you could try out Smocks. But it's Windows only, so if you're looking for an, a cross-platform alternative, I think for now the the um, community is a bit out of luck with that. Okay. At, at least until I can get back on to working on Pose. <laughs> okay. So uh, and Ozbob follows up here in the chat room saying looking for just Windows. So it looks like Smocks might be a good alternative for you, Ozbob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Smokes would be a good alternative if it's just Windows is looking at. Okay. I have a slightly unrelated question. So you're new sure. at Microsoft and you're working in, in a new uh, Microsoft office there, right? Yep, the ADC, Lagos. That, that stands for African Development Center. That is so cool. How many people are, are working there? Um, currently, we're about, uh, I think, 10 or 11. And we're working with, um, cogn with the cognition team, so the team responsible for the 
HoloLens and all the Azure Mixed Reality services and whatnot. <laughs> uh, we have a new team starting um, next, I think next month, and they'll be working with the Windows uh, team as well. So we're, we're growing, we're growing, baby steps. Very cool. <laughs> and one other question, <laughs> excuse me, one other question along that line. For our viewers that are in Africa, that are, that are new to .NET, want to get yeah. kind of hooked up with the community, is there, what, what's a good idea for them to do? Are there meetups? Uh, well, I mean, we do have a, it depends on what part of Africa they are in, but it's we do content. have a bunch of, <laughs> we do have a bunch of, um, like, uh, we do have a bunch of .NET Foundation meetups here. I, I know we have one here in Lagos, we have a few in um, Nairobi as well. So, um, yeah, I think they could either, if they could get across other African countries, or they could, I mean, they could look at starting their own meetups. And I think there's this new series that Scott Hanselman and, <laughs> and Kendra are kind of working on about like introduction to like C Sharp on .NET Core. They should also watch that, because I, I think it's pretty cool. Very cool. All right. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tony. We really appreciate having you joining us this year for .NET Conf. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, and this is an important slide here. Let's keep this up just for a second here. So that's that's his GitHub and and all the contact information. So yep. So if you have uh, questions, if you'd like to, uh, is there a way I can like I don't know share the slides or, or do we just assume everyone's going to watch the video? Uh, yeah, just we can. Asking. We can definitely share some slide share slides. Um, you can send them to me. You have my email address here because you're on the. Sure internal and uh we'll work on getting those links posted uh yeah. after the event awesome all right thanks guys all, all right. right thanks so much tony thanks so much tony take care uh, all right see ya all right goodbye tony